and we'll begin the presentation. So welcome everyone to this traffic safety webinar sponsored by the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program. This is one in a series of webinars addressing topics of interest for traffic safety professionals. The series is co-hosted by the Institute for Transportation Research and Education at NC State University and the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center. Today's topic is the Art and Science of Effective Travel Survey Design, presented by Wes Comfer, Dr. Tabitha Combs, and Seth Lajunus. Wes Comfer is an engineering research associate with HSRC where he focuses on crash analysis and safety education. He has expertise in crash model development, systematic safety analysis, and training program assessment. Dr. Tab Combs is a research associate and lecturer in the UNC Department of City and Regional Planning. She has expertise in transport and land use planning, the built environment travel behavior connection, and equity and health impacts of transport system interventions. TAB has nearly 20 years experience evaluating the effects of transport system design on travel behavior, access to opportunity, and well-being. Seth is an assistant director of the National Center for Safe Routes to School located at HSRC. As a researcher, he evaluates behavioral interventions designed to enhance bicycle and pedestrian safety and access, and designs studies that draw from psychology, sociology, and system science. Seth primarily focuses on studying youth traffic safety and discerning ways to accelerate the diffusion of effective road safety practice. So we want to welcome all of our distinguished presenters. And at this time, Wes, if you'll please share your screen to begin the presentation. Absolutely, thank you, Eugene. So um, I am trying to pull that up. All right. All right, thank you everyone for being here in West Comfort, and I'm going to be kicking off our webinar today on where do you go and how do you get there? The art and science of effective travel survey design. So our learning objectives for today, we hope that by the end of this webinar, you will be able to explain the reason for conducting travel surveys, identify the types of data you may collect with surveys, explain the principles of good survey design, and develop an effective survey tool. So what I want to start out with is uh, first letting you think through surveys that you have maybe had to conduct in the past for your job. Uh, maybe you were trying to try out some different project alternatives and you were given the task of going out into the community to gather community feedback on how well your project was going or what, how the community felt about some of these different alternatives. And so you were tasked with designing a survey. Maybe you've never done survey design before. Maybe you've done a couple surveys. Um, maybe you've used SurveyMonkey once or twice to send something out. And so you're tasked with that and you go out into the community and you try to share this survey and you get some data that you think is pretty good. Like, okay, yeah, I feel, feel decent about this. And so you take it back and then you use that data to make a decision. Well, what we're hoping that we will talk through with you today is whether or not that data that you gathered is actually telling you what you think it is and maybe some ways that you can think through how to write better surveys. And so I actually wanted to start with just showing you a survey question that many, many, many years ago, I once sent out through uh, SurveyMonkey to, uh, I think it was the American Bike League. And this included rank the following factors that discourage you from cycling more often in your community, with one being most important and seven being least important. So things like road safety, lack of transit connections, roadway design features not friendly to bicyclists, your terrain, your distance to destinations, lack of facilities or climate, uh, all these things can be ranked. And I think on its face, this seems like a reasonable question to ask people. You know, which of these things are, are barriers for them getting around by bike? And the implication there being that if these were improved somehow, uh, that more people would bike. Seems like a reasonable survey question. Uh, keep this one in mind as we go forward, because I want to actually talk to you a little bit about data before we come back to whether or not that was a good question. And so why do we collect any kind of traveler mobility data? This is really getting at the heart. Why would you go out there with a survey or why would you do something else? Uh, as a graduate student many years ago, I 
spend a lot of time sitting in a car on the side of the road clicking something to count cars. Uh, we've Data is really intrinsic to all the decisions we make for different projects. And so we collect data to figure out who is traveling, where they are going, how they are getting there, in what number, and we cannot design a system, let alone plan for the use of that system, if we do not have data that inform our decisions. Now, I do want to note here that I use data inform rather than data driven. We've probably all heard that we need data driven solutions. I think if you have bad data, you don't want your bad data driving your decisions. Uh, but if you have good data, you do want that to help you make a more informed decision when it comes to projects or facilities that you implement. So some different ways that we collect data. I am probably preaching to the choir here, but we can use traffic counts. Uh, counting stations on highways are common. Sometimes you go out and lay pneumatic tubes if you want to get a quick estimate. Uh, traffic cameras are, are more and more sophisticated and can collect that data for us. Sometimes some facilities will see radars. Uh, we can use ticket sales and transit alightings. This is a common one that you often see if you want to know how well your public transit is being utilized. And recently in the field, we've seen the versions of data brokers like, like Streetlight or Cubic who are uh, taking mobile device data and translating that into trips. And that's something that has especially been of interest in the COVID-19 pandemic as many of our travel trends have changed. Some of these uh, companies are actually offering very unique and interesting data that we can examine. But we take all this data and we can perform a few different types of analyses or make decisions with it. So we can do things like doing a volume to capacity analysis using our simulation software to figure out how utilized the specific uh, roadway or piece of infrastructure is. And that's what the figures I have at the bottom there are from a, a design project a long time ago where we were looking at the level of service at a current intersection or interchange design and then trying to see what it would look like if it was a roundabout or something else. Um, you can take these data and you can add them to some trips that you've generated using say the IT trip generation handbook to figure out how many trips you might be able to expect from a new development. And we can decide where we need more capacity. These data allow us to identify points of congestion, maybe identify points of uh, conflicts between bicyclists and pedestrians and vehicles. And so we can use these data to help inform our decisions. And we can also use these data to try to figure out where people are going. Uh, so we can do trip assignments based on our adjacent land use. So say, we know that this is gonna be a commercial property, so we expect this number of people to be using the adjacent roads or adjacent links on our network. And we can distribute our trips with models like the gravity model. And we can perform some OD analysis, origin destination, if we wanna know where are people going and where are they coming from. These are all pretty intrinsic in the way that we do our traffic planning processes. So what do all these data and analyses really tell us? And this is something I want you to think back to that first survey question, but also think back to all the data I just showed you. And that is, these data tell us how people currently travel within the system we've designed and built for them. This is a normative travel behavior, meaning we are taking a snapshot of the presence of who's using the road by the modes that we have allowed them to use. I think it's worth really considering that statement and what is normative travel behavior and whether or not we can base predictions on our current travel behavior. Uh, some things and questions to raise about this are that trip generation is pretty notoriously fraught. Um, some models are just based on very, very few studies and some research has shown that when you add capacity, you get more traffic, you can generate more traffic. Uh, this is something that has happened in California on the freeways where they add two lanes and suddenly those lanes are congested too. So rather than alleviating traffic, you can actually create more um, through this process. Uh, maybe the modes that people use really aren't reflective of the modes they would like to use. Maybe a common example of this might be, say you go out and you are trying to figure out how many pedestrians are using a particular way to see if it needs uh, some maybe a crosswalk there. And so you go out and you look and you see, oh, well, there aren't really any pedestrians walking here. I guess no pedestrians want to use this road, so I guess we don't actually need to invest in a pedestrian treatment here. Well, that's some faulty logic based on what's happening. Maybe the reason pedestrians aren't walking there is because there isn't a facility that they can walk on. Maybe they're not walking there because they don't have 
uh, they don't feel safe. Maybe there isn't a sufficient buffer between high speed traffic and the sidewalk for them to very, uh, feel very comfortable walking in that location. So we need to be careful how we use these snapshots of the current modes to make assumptions about how other people might get around. And then these data, like I said, don't tell us how people would prefer to travel. Maybe people don't wanna walk there. Maybe they would prefer to take a bus if possible. And we're not necessarily collecting that data just by going and counting their cars that we have uh, on that road at that time. So one solution, uh, not just the only solution, but one solution is to conduct our travel surveys to uncover factors that influence people's travel behavior and patterns. So if we wanna know uh, where people are going, sometimes we can just ask them or ask them why they're going somewhere, what mode they would like to get there. We can try to uncover some of these preferences. And so some different kinds of data that we can collect would be things like our level of comfort with our existing infrastructure, um, where the destinations that people are actually going to, and our current and future behavioral affordances. So we can try to get assumptions based on where people would go if they had the right mode. So this is from a study that we recently completed working with um, some partners at Portland State and Kittleson, where we were trying to assess the safety and comforts of using different kinds of uh, crosswalk treatments or intersection treatments for pedestrians. And we went out and did intercept surveys, meaning we caught people as they were crossing the road and asked them, how would you rate your crossing experience? And they told us things like, I felt like I might get hit uh, by a car when crossing here, or I felt delayed when trying to cross the street. And we did a number of different modeling exercises on these and found that people were much more satisfied with their crossing experience when they were crossing at an LPI compared to saying unmarked controlled or unmarked controlled crosswalk. You can also do things like trip analysis. So this is from a project I did again when I was at Texas Tech University, uh, trying to figure out for the Texas Department of Transportation, why no one was driving on the underutilized and maybe over capacity, uh, or sorry, high capacity freeway on the east side of town. If you look in that diagram below, there's a loop there. Out on the east side of that loop, there's really no traffic there. And TxDOT wanted to know why the trucks weren't using that part of the highway. Well, we did some surveys of the uh, companies in town and asked them, like, where are your trucks coming from? Where are they going? and found that a lot of that traffic was coming from out of town and going toward uh, the downtown area and the warehouses. And so they weren't using that road because it didn't fit their route. And then we can also, you see examples like this from North Carolina deploying surveys to try to figure out how they should prioritize projects for their long range planning. So after walking through those illustrations uh, and showing you how we can use data to make some better decisions, I do want to note that things can quickly go awry. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tabitha. Thanks, Wes. Um, hey, everybody. Um, should I go ahead and share my screen? Yeah. Actually, Wes, if you want to click through these, that's fine, too. Oh. Okay. Awesome. So, we know that things can go awry um, because I think everybody has probably taken a survey that they, um, they encounter a question and, and they feel like, wait, wait, what is this question asking? Um, and so there are a lot of ways that, that you, can, um, you can write your questions that aren't going to generate the sorts of information that you're looking for. I wanna walk through just a few examples, um, a handful of examples, and talk about a little bit about why these questions might not be getting you the sorts of information um, that you're looking for. So this is the first one. Um, it's uh, people are asking this question to predict the future. It's what we call behavioral forecasting. Um, and it's really hard to do. Um, there's quite a bit of, of literature out there that shows that um, you know, from a psychological standpoint, we're just not very good at knowing who we will be in the future. Um, and particularly not knowing how we will um, engage in new behaviors in the future. So if you're presented with, in this, in this instance, a new bikeway, um, how it's hard to imagine how future you will respond to this new thing, maybe a new behavior, a new facility. Um, and so questions where we ask people to predict this um, new behavior at some point in the time um, can give you some pretty misleading results. Can you go to the next one? Next slide. This one is a you know, spin-off of the last one. 
uh, predicting the really distant future. So this question was asked um, in 2010, 2011, about um, how people will want to travel in 2020. Um, obviously, we you know 30 years um, is a long time. It's a long time to ask people to to predict what they're going to be doing. And it, you know you can sort of empathize with with the reason this question was asked. We're routinely um, asking planners and engineers and, and decision makers to prevent present evidence to support the sorts of plans that they want to want to um, want to propose. Um, you know, how will people use this facility? What what you know, what are people's needs going to be 30 years in the future? Um, put that into a chart that we can then put into the, the evidence base of, of the plans that we're producing. And so it's a really big ask um, that we're asking of, of our um, of our plan makers. Um, and uh, it results, you know, that that request often results in questions like this. Well, I don't know what the public's going to do in 30 years. Let me ask. The public doesn't know that either. Either. All right. Next slide, please. Um, and then this is another question that I just I put into um to emphasize uh, how often we are asked to make these long-range projections, and we just sort of pass the buck on to the public. This question asks not what you are going to do in 30 years, but what what will be important to your loved ones in 30 years. Um, you know, 10 years ago, I had no idea who my loved ones would be in 2040. So again, this is a pretty egregious example, but not a terribly uncommon example, just because of what we're, um, we often ask our, our plan makers to do in order to, to, to make the best possible long range decisions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a question in which the um, participant was given no or very little context. Um, the participants in this um, survey were asked, do you think the best facility, the best accommodation for a particular um, long distance bikeway network is a bike lane? Um, you know, if any of you who have done any work with um, bicycle planning will understand that there is a context for every facility. Um, in some places, bike lanes work great. In some places, bike lanes are absolutely the wrong thing to try and implement. People who are taking this survey will not know what the context is for this question, will default to the current experience. If they've ridden in a bike lane that was used inappropriately, they're probably going to not value a bike lane. If the only bike lanes that they've ever ridden in have been wonderful bike lanes um, appropriately implemented, their response is going to be a lot different. And so not providing context makes it makes it really difficult to for people to respond to the question, and then for you as the um, as the analyst to interpret those results. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a classic double barrel question where you ask a participant two things at once. Um, so should heavier vehicles pay more in fees and taxes than regular passenger vehicles, or should all vehicles pay the same amount regardless of weight? That is technically two questions, right? Um, so it can be broken down um, as two because when you're when you're answering this question, you may think both of these things are true, neither of these things are true, but you're asked to, to choose one or the other. Um, I did want to leave this slide up for a sec just to see if anybody else um, can point anything else interesting out about this question. Um, if so, why don't you, if you've got any comments or, or points about that, um, you can throw that up in the, the Q&A if you want. All right, um, not seeing anything popping up in the Q&A yet. So um, I'll just point it out. Look at the pie chart. Um, look at the, um, the responses, how, the, how they were categorized. Now, to be fair, this is not how the question was asked. The responses were um, you know, an A or a B uh, type response. But the way that the analysts then um, recoded those responses um, to, to put this, the results out for the public, um, it's pretty interesting, right? It, it seems to me like the, the analysts had a response they were looking for. Um, and I think that just the way that this was, was analyzed and presented um, sort of underscores what, what, that, what that agenda might have been. I'm not sure which is no and which is yes in this case. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is another one that, that we see kind of commonly. Um, this is disproportionality or um, sort of in, in layperson's term, incomparable comparisons. 
you're asking people to compare how much they spend on fuel for motor vehicles versus um, much, typically much cheaper forms of, of transportation. Uh, in the context of North Carolina in particular, we don't have that many opportunities to pay for public transit for um, ferry tolls or highways um, or shared bikes. And so um, putting these up on the same scale is, can, can lead to some results that, that may overweight um, some, some responses versus others. Can you go to the next slide, please? So on this next slide, this is the exact same question. These are the responses. Um, and as we would expect, it looks like fuel for personal motor vehicles is a huge expense. And you know, people maybe aren't using these other things because they're not spending much money on them. But you know, if you really dig into it, fuel for personal motor vehicles is really quite expensive. And it's one of the reasons people choose other modes is to, to, to save money. So think about whether or not your response categories can all be measured on the same scale when you're designing a question like this. All right, next, next slide, please. Um, this is another quest type of question that can get pretty common. Um, this is where the question sort of sets the agenda. Um, you know, there's a saying that there's no such thing as a value neutral survey, and I think this is a good example. Um, the question is, what is North Carolina's biggest transportation challenge? And then we have six different, um, different options, which may or may not jive with what a respondent might um, might view as North Carolina's biggest transportation challenge. Um, so the, the question itself constrains you to one of these six things and doesn't give you the option of choosing um, something that may be more meaningful to you as, as a participant. Um, there's also um, a jargon factor going on here with, um, with some of these responses, uh, particularly with connectivity. Um, connectivity for someone who is um, big into walking or bicycling means something very different from someone who maybe rides regional rail um, and something different entirely for someone who focuses on broadband. Um, so, you know, making sure that the response categories that you're, you're providing really only have one interpretation. You know, um, respondents can't, you know, for I would consider connectivity as a pedestrian to be, is the sidewalk complete from, you know, point A to point B. Um, someone who is desperately trying to connect their child to their um, remote learning, remote school um, for the fall semester um, and lives in a rural area probably has a very different impression of what connectivity means to them. So just think about, can do, do people experience the terms, the words that you're using um, in different ways? Um, next slide, please. This is another example of, of, a, um, of a question that's got unclear wording on the responses um, and also um, in exhaustive choice sets. Um, what is the greatest investment need to meet future transportation technological challenges? Um, the question itself is a little bit hard to, to wrap your head around. Perhaps if this question were only um, asked of transportation professionals, um, in particular people who are working in the area of transportation technology, this question might make sense, but to the lay public, and this, this question was posed to the lay public, um, it's pretty hard to understand um, what these things might be, what these uh, different responses might be. And they might not, um, some, some regular members of the public, these things might not matter to any of them. They might not feel like any of these are worthy of investment because they won't relate to them. Um, you know, for, from a personal standpoint, I would look at monitoring airspace usage for drone deliveries and I think, I don't know, that's like the airplane people, that, you know, that's, that's for them to think about. Um, and, you know, there, these, if the response categories aren't relevant um, to, your, um, to your participants, um, they might not have any, any clue how to answer them. And then there's um, this unsure at the bottom. Um, it's kind of a demeaning uh, response category. Um, you know, I think the last thing you want to do is make your participants feel like there are right and wrong answers. Um, and I feel like this uh, unsure option would do that. I don't know what the greatest investment need is because this is not the kind of stuff I think about on a regular basis. Um, unsure makes me think I'm, I'm supposed to know this. I'm supposed to know the answer to this test question and I don't. Um, People generally want to help. Uh, survey respondents want to give you truthful information because it's in our nature to be helpful. 
And, and this sort of question might put people off of that because it undermines that, that desire to be useful, to give you helpful information. Next slide, please. Um, this is an example of a, um, a very leading or presumptuous question for your next vehicle purchase. Which type of vehicle do you plan to buy? Um, it's, it's a very presumptuous question because it assumes that people will be buying a vehicle at some point. Um, in addition to asking them to predict the future, um, and predict a future that may be a um, varying distance away, um, depending on who is responding. Um, you're, so you're asking them to predict this, this, this unknown, uncertain um, length of time into the future, and you're assuming that they're going to buy a vehicle. And you're really only giving them three options for the kinds of vehicles that they might want to buy. So um, a very leading question. There's no, I don't plan to buy a vehicle, um, or I don't plan to buy, buy a vehicle in the next 15 years, or within the range of the, you know, the, the technology lifespan of these options that you've given me or, or whatnot. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then we've got uh, this question that, that I really kind of like it. You know, it's a, it's a, I think it's a fairly straightforward question. Um, a transportation network should, and you know, if you give people enough context, they probably will form some ideas about what a transportation network should be. Um, the reason I threw this, um, this slide in here, and this is the last example I've got, is it's, an, it's a great example of not, not necessarily knowing how you're going to interpret the results of your question before you frame it. Um, so in this question, respondents were asked to um, rank one to, well, four to one, with four being the most important um, thing that a transportation network should do, um, and one being the least important thing a transportation network should do. Um, you can run into trouble with, with this kind of um, way to set up a response because you are putting value on, pe on responses that people may find to be very unimportant. You're forcing them to put a two or a one on the things that don't matter to them. And so um, mathematically, you end up overestimating the influence of things that your respondents found um, unimportant. Um, I put this up here because I think um, it's a good example of you know, the question. The question may have been, um, a very well thought out question, but if you've not thought out the way the response categories will then translate to a useful interpretation, um, you're going to end up having to throw out the question in your analysis. And with that, I am going to hand you over to Seth, who can help you understand some of the theory behind why some of these questions um, may have seemed good at the time when they were being written up, but end up bombing in practice. Thanks, Deb. And Wes, were you going to hand over the presentation? I have stopped sharing, so feel free to share. Fantastic. All right, thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. And th special thanks to, to ITRI's team, uh, Eugene, Matthew, and Tracy. Uh, for orchestrating this and inviting us to um, to speak with you all today. Tab hit on some really uh, critical and really common uh, points about survey design, survey question design, uh, response options, and some of the major limitations that we see. I'm just going to hit upon a couple of, of those again, putting in the context of a bit of uh, what, we, what we know about human behavior, and then really get into the not only what we do ask right now commonly in sort of trans travel surveys, but what we often miss and don't ask that people are actually quite capable of providing us that's really valuable. Um, so one, the, more, the theme that we see uh, in a lot of surveys is that surveys ask us to tell a lot more than what we can know. And what we mean by that, and it's actually a, a name of a paper from the 70s, telling more than we can know. Um, one of the authors was this person here, Timothy Wilson, who wrote this great book that summarizes about 40 years worth of research on this called Strangers to Ourselves. The basic premise is that we humans, uh, we lack access to our mental content. Um, there's various reasons for that. Uh, there, a lot of them are pretty protective. We probably don't want to see everything that's going on in our noggins. Um, which, what that means for surveys is that we can't accurately report 
to people, basically, if they just asked us, why do you do these things? Or what will you do in the future? Or behavioral forecasting. It's very difficult for us to access that cognitively. So we come up with um, things that we may have heard or uh, some experiences that we'll project in the future, you know, things that we're doing now that we'll say that we're doing in 30 years, even though we have no idea if that's true. Um, another, some really interesting work has been done in uh, how we will feel in the future. So affective forecasting. Um, Daniel Gilbert out of Harvard has studied that for years as well. And um, it's really one really interesting study I remember was at uh, the Ohio University where they asked people, how will you feel if your team wins? And they'll say, I'll be ecstatic. They're talking about the football team. How, you, how will you feel if they lose? Uh, oh, I'll be totally depressed. I won't be able to go to class, uh, and all the, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what they had found is that it didn't, they were actually pretty terrible at uh, predicting how they would feel because they discounted all the things that actually happened after the game, which was them being with their friends, maybe some going out drinking, but basically being around people that they enjoy the company of. And uh, that's what actually lifted up their mood, despite the fact that the team had lost. They all predicted that they would feel terrible, but they ended up feeling uh, okay the next day. We are notoriously terrible at predicting how we will behave and feel in the future. Um, asking too much of our memory as well. Uh, we often will say like Tab had shown about, um, you know, how a lot of these surveys ask questions about really unbound time. Um, we know that after about a month, uh, the, actually after about a day, our, our memory decays rapidly uh, and then starts flat mining from about a week out to a month out. So the upshot of this is when we ask people about their past behavior, we really want to bound it in more recent history. Uh, a great example is this comes from the International Physical Activity Questionnaire, which is shown to, to pre predict or uh, explain rather um, walking, biking, leisure uh, physical activity behaviors quite well, we, even when you look at more objective measures. Um, so this is like during the last seven days on how many days did you walk for 10 minutes at a time to go from place to place. So as you can see, it's quite specific. It's asking about more utilitarian walking to get from place to place. That takes place more than just from your car to the front door of, of some place, right? And talk about 10 minutes, um, how many days in the last seven days. So this is just an example of how we can put some bounds on this and be more specific about what exactly we're, we're really looking for. Leading questions. So Tab provided a, a great examples of leading questions. Um, we see these constantly over time, especially things that are sort of moral judgments. Um, seatbelts save lives. How often do you wear a seatbelt? You know, so you're basically leading the person to say, oh, of course I'm going to be doing this. Uh, a lot of this has to do with social de desirability bias. We really do want to preserve a positive self-image. And even in, in um, more anonymous contexts like surveys, we still want to uh, preserve that often. Um, so some, some ways to do this are really those, those leading or sensitive questions. Avoid those and think about writing items more in a neutral way or less obviously popular in the, the population. Um, these are ways to sort of neutralize the effect of this um, and to avoid that, you know, counter that social desirability bias we see uh, in a lot of surveys. This, which brings us to the questions that um, we often don't see in surveys. We see some in really well-designed ones. Uh, they're not too prevalent. And they can really provide us with a lot of good insight into what does influence uh, our travel behavior. So not asking about our social environment, for instance. Social environment is critical, especially what important others do and think we should do. So these are more descriptive and what are called injunctive norms. Our friends and family and coworkers especially, less so our neighbors. But these people, these groups tend to influence us in ways we're not even aware. Um, so asking questions about that. Do a lot of people um, in, in your life that matter to you, do they wear seatbelts? Do, do they ride a bike uh, to get from place to place? Asking about that can provide a lot of insight into, you know, maybe their, their social environment around this. Um, we're also really influenced by uh, what, what in literature is often called self-efficacy or competence. Um, what we're good at doing, we enjoy doing more of. Uh, that's just part of our human nature. 
So if we really feel like we're good at driving, which most people feel like they are good drivers, in fact, more, more than well, close to about 90% of people think they're better, uh, better than average, which is a, a statistical impossibility. But beside that, uh, this contributes to a lot of why we continue, see, uh, continue seeing these behaviors, uh, driving. Uh, if you're, you feel like you are competent biking, that is a good indicator that you will continue doing so, or competent in negotiating the transit system, likewise. Um, but a lot of this comes from supportive physical environments if you talk about mode choice. So uh, when we see a strong correlation between people's self-efficacy and environments which actually do enable and support uh, biking, walking, uh, transit use. Um, so asking about that, their perceived ability to travel safely using these different modes, do they feel like they're capable of doing that? That can give you a lot of insight into whether or not they will in fact do that. Um, meaningful choice. So this relates to a construct um, often called uh, autonomy. So are we making self-directed behaviors? Are our, are our behaviors self-directed? Um, so it basically asking people, to what extent do you feel like your mode choice or your route choice uh, are something that is governed by you? Um, that can help us understand, are people feeling like they have some, um, some influence? on how they get around and the decisions they're making. Um, another one is what we, we call prototypical image or what uh, particularly, members, particularly members of a population might think is cool. Um, speeding is sort of a, a, a central one in this literature. Um, certain parts of the population think that it's kind of cool to zip down a highway or through a community um, or fun to do that. So tapping into this, even just asking um, basic questions, maybe to what extent they agree with something, like I think you know driving above the speed limit is fun, you know things like that. You get a general sense of um, do they feel do they have a, a positive prototypical image around the sort of unsafe behavior around speeding or any other behavior you're sort of interested in. We're strongly influenced by the plans or intentions or willingness uh, to do something. Um, this is from a literature as well. Um, often, if we have an intention, we can, we can act upon that intention if our environment supports that. So a great example from a lot of the literature comes from uh, motorcycle helmets. Um, if people have a plan or in, intend to um, go purchase a helmet, how easy is it for them to do that? So we can pair survey questions with policy change about if we see a lot of people actually have intentions to, to protect themselves in this way, how do we make it easier that, for them to do that? Um, so this is just an example question in that regard. How often in the next week, again, time bounding that, do you plan to wear a helmet when riding a bike, a motorcycle? So it's just an example of how we can tap in again to uh, intentions to behave in safer ways. Um, and then probably uh, for travel, especially in routine travel, like commuting, which we all used to do, remember that? Um, those things that we were used to do, these often happen uh, largely outside of conscious awareness. So they are really strong uh, predictors and pre given context um, like commuting. Um, and we can tap into that. We can ask to what extent people feel like um, they do these things habitually without a lot of thinking about it. Um, and a lot of behavior occurs outside of this really active thinking and is just sort of automated. Even uh, most driving trips, once people get settled in the car and are driving someplace, they're just on autopilot, right? We've probably all experienced that. Um, so asking about that and the results that you can get can give you an insight of how many people in the population are really... Um, really have habits around maybe, uh, maybe there's their bad habits, uh, unsafe habits. Um, gives you a sense of what you could be working on policy-wise. And then uh, the, one of the, the critical ones as well is a lot of what, how we'll respond to surveys is gonna be informed as Tab had, had said by our direct experience. Um, so, <clears throat> and Wes pointed out that we asked a question about um, how would you rate your crossing experience? Uh, this is something uh, that people had just endured, which was crossing a road. Um, that's a helpful thing because then they have a sort of an image in their mind about what they've just, uh, what they've just endured. Um, 
asking about their experiences is a good idea um, to talk about, maybe even get specific about it with a time bound, um, specific places, that sort of thing. Um, if we do want to get an, an insight into um, what's available to people, not necessarily how they will behave if a change is made, but what's available, we can ask about affordances. This is a fancy word of basically saying, are there things in the environment that enable us to act in certain ways? So to walk safely across the street, to bike, to take the train, uh, transit, um, to drive there. Um, so an example of this would be um, having people reflect upon if there are certain uh, key destinations within a certain uh, walk shed. So 10 minutes and in nice weather. So some people might be thinking about terrible experiences they had to Tab's point about this. If you say, when the night weather's nice and within 10 minutes, would you be able to walk to a grocery store? Could you imagine yourself sort of doing that at this point? Um, so then when you do make a change or introduce maybe other destinations within that 10 minute walk shed, you'll get a sense of at least that is something that they might be able to do in the future. And then all of those other questions you asked about their social environment, how they felt, do they feel like they're capable of doing it? Do they have habits around it? You can get a general sense and predict to some extent whether or not they may actually be quite attracted um, to walking or biking to certain destinations. So I think um, one of the things that not we won't exactly end on, well, I'll end on a question, but just want to hammer home these ideas. And again, these are not um, these are not uh, authoritative at all. It's basically wrapping up what we've talked about today, some of the things we've learned about survey design. But if we know more about how people think and what motivates them, um, and if we can consider what we'll learn from the responses, as Tab was saying, um, we can probably build better, more policy re relevant uh, surveys. But the, la the question I have for this group here is, we, we've just discussed what surveys can, to some extent, can and cannot tell us. What is typically not collected from surveys, uh, but is really important for, for policy making? So I'll sort of end there. Okay, Seth, thank you very much. Is that an open question that you'd like to for folks to respond to? That is right. Day? If at all possible, it'd be lovely to hear um, people's thoughts on that or anybody, anybody's thoughts on that. All right, well, I'll put back up the reminder of the um, how you can uh, use Q&A or if you'd like to raise your hand uh, and make a comment, um, either one of those options are available to you. Uh, while we are waiting for uh, some responses to come in, um, uh, I do have a question uh, to ask of our panelists here. Uh, mm -hmm. what, how often should you survey people in the community? Who wants to tackle that? How about it, son? <laughs> That's a fair question, Eugene. Um, I think as Wes laid out in the beginning of the, the, sir, uh, the, the presentation, um, how often we, we ask is really dependent on what our objectives for the survey are. Um, there's different types of surveys, right? There's surveillance surveys. So these are, we really want to track behaviors over time in a population. Uh, we want to do that on regular intervals, maybe yearly, every other year, every five years. Um, but if there's ones about, you know, some big change is gonna be coming, it's uh, less a question about how often, it's how do we time that before we make these changes and maybe after we make the changes, that sort of thing. But if uh, Wes and Tab, if you have any, anything else you wanna contribute to that. Yes, yeah, I might just add that uh, doing a before and after a project is initiated is a really good way to collect some data that might be helpful for future projects. So let's say that you, are uh, installing a new roundabout at an intersection. Maybe you do a before question about uh, how people got around that intersection prior to the roundabout, and then you ask them those same questions afterward and see 
if that has improved, whatever metric you're looking for, uh, that's a good way to at least gather some evidence for maybe the next roundabout to, that you install to see if it can go a bit more smoothly or, or meets the same needs. Yep, um, and I, I agree with both of you. I just wanted to add too that there is a, um, there is a, the, the chance that you may introduce survey fatigue. Um, and so if it's the same population that you're asking questions for over and over again, without having laid that out at the beginning that this is you know, part of a two-part series or part of a, a panel, um, you may run into the case where people just get tired of answering. Um, so definitely keep that in mind. If you do plan to repeat it, um, make sure people know at the outset that you're probably gonna hit them up again. Um, they'll tend to respond a little bit more warmly to the second round. Thank you all for that response. Uh, another question that uh, we have, what are some tips for gathering more representative feedback from the community? Uh, I feel like, yeah, Wes, you have. I was just gonna say one that might be useful is to consider the primary language of the people within your community. And that would be to, if you're trying to do uh, say measure the impacts of a project on a specific neighborhood, it would be good to know if uh, folks who don't speak English live in that neighborhood and maybe to produce survey materials that are translated well by an expert into Spanish, for example, um, to you know gather that information. And so I do think it's actually worth working with a translator rather than just Google uh, translating that because you don't want to introduce some weird grammatical errors that might throw your responses off. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good point, Wes. Is is know the population um, from whom you are seeking you know, information from your survey. Uh, but this also, um, I think, sort of gets to Seth's question that he ended um, his presentation with, um, which is, are there other ways to get information? Um, maybe some people don't have access to your survey or aren't um, aren't aware that you're conducting a survey, or maybe the survey is. Um, in spite of all your best intentions, giving you responses that are biased towards a certain um, segment of, of society as well. Hey, thank you. Um, again, reminder of folks, if you do have some questions or comments, uh, please uh, use the Q&A window uh, to type those in or to raise your hand. Uh, we just, we still have a few minutes left uh, in our um, webinar uh, for me. I'm sorry for for me for today. Um, and uh, I've got a question um, come in here is what is the wrong or right? Uh, what was wrong or right with the question at the beginning of the presentation? Um, and I'm not uh, trying to recall what that question is. Um, yeah, so Eugene, that question was about uh, ranking the things that are barriers for people riding a bike. And I would say there are two sorts of issues about that. And one is that's a why type question, which Seth addressed as being a limitation. Uh, those are often very hard for people to answer about why they don't do something. And the second is that when you have ranked choice, uh, that those can produce some useful data, but they can also be awfully hard to analyze. And if you have multiple rankings that are all the same, and it's something like say, the climate is a reason that I can't uh, bike around in my neighborhood. Well, what are you gonna do about the climate? I, I think it's those kinds of ranked choice questions seem useful at the start, but they often give you data that isn't very easy to analyze or use. Okay, thank you, Wes. Um, mm -hmm. And that maybe ties into this next question that, um, we have, um, what can't you learn from a survey? Is there information that you just really uh, can't glean very well from a survey? I'll open it up to whoever, yes. Tabitha. Yes, the answer, um, the answer is, is yes. Surveys can be incredibly useful um, for understanding motivations, um, reasons why people are doing things they're doing, the behaviors that aren't being captured um, in the typical um, count methods. But there is a lot of information that is difficult to get from a survey, um, particularly information about um, unmet demand. Surveys are, will do a good job of capturing um, um, what I think Wes mentioned earlier about stated preferences and revealed preferences, but they won't capture, capture information about 
what would you do if suddenly you had new transportation options or what sorts of activities are you not engaging in? Um, and you know, one of the reasons for that is that we don't like to think, you know, as humans, we don't like to think about the, the what if scenario that often. It's just not a very healthy thing. You know, if only my life were you know, 10 points better on this life goodness scale, these are the ways everything would change. It's hard to predict that and it's not something that we tend to think a lot about. Um, and so understanding how people might benefit from a new facility, um, really that information comes out a lot better in a focus group or an interview where you can hash through um, you know, what people's life circumstances are, um, what sorts of challenges they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So surveys are definitely useful, but there is often more to the story um, than just what you can get from the survey. Tab, thank yeah. you. Seth? Yeah, yeah Eugene, I, Tab, I, yes, here, here. Uh, there's, there are many things that we, we can't get. Um, uh, the latest estimate I've seen is about half of our behavior is determined mostly by unconscious processes. So we don't have access to what, to a lot of the things that impact us, right? So we can't report those things. So a lot of it actually is gonna be coming from other means like close observation right of people um, most most of us don't have a sense of how um, environmental phenomenon impacts us for instance uh, air quality right it's unless there's something really noxious in the air we don't really have a sense of of how that is affecting our, our day to day it's other means that are telling us that right it's other data sources so there's things about Surveys are very useful, as Tab and, and Wes have been saying about perceptions, motivations, um, even maybe even predicting some of our behaviors, but um, there's a lot of things they, that they miss and they, they seem to need to be uh, incorporated with other methods to get a more holistic understanding of what drives people and uh, how uh, different changes uh, impact them. Very good, thank you, Seth. Um, another question that's uh, come in here, um, it, uh, presuming there that the survey creator could have some sort of unintentional or inherent bias, uh, what are some ways you would suggest that you could reduce that bias uh, that might enter into a survey that you create? Yeah, I'll take a, I'll take a step. That, that's a great question. We all have an inherent bias. Um, and uh, that's a really important question to ask. Um, one of the one of the things you can do is don't do your survey alone. You know, we always have to say get someone else to read your work before you submit, um, you know, a paper or an article or a memo. The same thing with survey questions. Um, pilot them uh, with people that that you know and trust to um, to point out you know, differences in perspective. Um, I don't think that you know there's not a a survey bias checker tool on the internet that you can run through. So you've got to you've got to shop it around um, and find people who can who have different viewpoints that can um, can respond um, with you sitting there, respond to your survey questions, and then tell you why they made that response, tell you what their thought process was um, when when they responded in that way. Um, and if that does not make sense, if that doesn't jive with what you were thinking with the people's thought process, then maybe you need to to take another look at the, the wording of the question or the response choices. Tab, thank you. Let me see if I can squeeze in one final question. Oh, I'm sorry, Seth, did hey, you have a response Eugene, to that? Eugene, yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention that Tab was, uh, was describing what we uh, call cognitive interviewing. And I'm just gonna put in here um, a link to a resource on that, if that's okay. You're gonna put that in the... Um... In the chat. In the chat, okay. Yeah. So folks, you'll open up the chat window. Seth is gonna post the link in there. And we've also got a couple of comments from that, uh, come in from that last question. Um, getting or acquiring cultural humility training can really help in addressing that bias issue uh, prior to creating the survey, of course, if possible. Thank you for those comments and um, and uh, thank you for posting that link into the uh, into the chat window. I'm gonna try to squeeze in this one last question. Um, is there a sort of a rule of thumb as to how long or short a survey should be? 
There, there sort of is, Eugene. Um, there seems to be a lot of uh, agreement around, if at all possible, making a survey uh, no longer than 10 minutes in length to, to complete. Uh, of course, we understand that others, some surveys do require more effort. Uh, usually get into the maybe we should um, compensate people for their time for, for longer surveys because we do fatigue pretty rapidly, um, especially when we're asked to give a lot of thoughtful responses uh, to a survey. All right, Seth, thank you there for that uh, response. I see some uh, acknowledgement there from uh, uh, the other presenters as well. Uh, and unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's uh, presentation. So I want to thank very much uh, Wes, Tab, and Seth for your presentations. I want to thank everyone else who joined us uh, today. Uh, if we were unable to get a, an answer to your question, if you'll let us know, um, just go ahead and post it in the Q&A. Um, and we'll get, try to get a response to you uh, later by email. And also, before you leave, uh, use the Q&A window to share any suggestions um, uh, that you may have uh, to help us improve this webinar series or future topics that, that you'd like to learn about. Uh, remember to watch for a link in a follow-up email with the recording as soon as that's available. And uh, the, those professional engineers who are participating in today's live webinar, you can get a uh, earn one PDH credit toward your continuing education requirement. So will be a, a, a certificate will be sent out to you. Uh, if, if other participants in the webinar, if you'd also like to receive that certificate, if you'll just simply reply to that follow-up email um, and let us know. Uh, and uh, we invite you to join us for other traffic safety webinars planned for this series. You can visit the website link on your screen for a list of upcoming uh, webinars. This is at our North Carolina Traffic Safety Conference um, website. And you, there you can also learn about uh, the upcoming next uh, North Carolina Traffic Safety Conference, which will be in the fall of 2021. Uh, we hope you'll be able to attend the conference and we also invite you to propose topics for presentation at that event. There's a, a link on the website for presentation proposals to submit your ideas. And with that, we want to thank you again for participating uh, in today's webinar and goodbye for now. <music>